think I think we can get started now, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to this monthly webinar with me, Michael Houston and Colin Szynski, who's our Canadian North American analyst. And um, let's first and foremost uh, get the obligatory disclaimer out of the way for uh, compliance purposes. But it's certainly been an interesting week um, coming on the back of coming on the back of. Um, a fairly good, well, I say fairly good non-farm payrolls number. It was above 200,000, 200, 214,000. Um, I think market expectations were slightly elevated in terms of what we were expecting with respect to the number, numbers in excess of 250. And um, we, are, we are in fact higher, certainly on the S&P 500, also on the Dow Jones. But I think what is actually quite... Um, interesting is the fact that uh, European markets have really struggled to follow, um, to, to, to really follow through on the gains that we're seeing in the S&P and the Dow. Yes, the FTSE is also up, and that's sort of been one of the main outliers. That's pr that's probably more closely tracked what the S&P and the Dow are doing. But the German DAX, the the CAC 40, they're still struggling well below their 200-day moving averages. And really, we're going to have a look at those those key, the, the key levels in the European indices for, um, you know, for evidence that we're going to see further gains there because at the moment we do, seem to, we do appear to be capped. The gains that we're seeing are tending to be very, very hard won and yet U.S. markets can continue to go from strength to strength. I had a quick, quick chance to look at the internals of the jobs data that we saw on Friday and what struck me was that even though the headline number disappointed and the unemployment rate uh, ticked up a little bit, there was a significant upward revision to the August number. Now, the August number, you may recall, came in at 142,000 on the first print. That has since now been revised up to 203. So based on the fact that the internals of the ISMs last week, the manufacturing and the services, showed strong employment components, I think there's a very good chance that this payrolls number that we saw for October could be revised up, you know, and I think that's something when we come to the December payrolls number, we also need to keep a close eye on because usually the previous two months also get revised up or down. So it's not just about the headline number, it's also about the revisions higher on the previous numbers. So anyway, I've digressed a little bit and sort of droned on a little bit. We've, we've had a little, we've had a, Pretty, we haven't had that much U.S. data to really get our heads around this week. Um, it's been more focused on company earnings, and by and large, they've come in broadly in line or slightly above expectations. But I think the key, the key data item to look at this week will be tomorrow's retail sales numbers for the U.S. Because despite the gains that we're seeing in U.S. equity markets, the U.S. consumer over the course of the past few months has been has been one of the main laggards. You know, and that, for me, is one of the key concerns that I have about this particular recovery. That being said, we are where we are, and the S&P and the Dow are making new all-time highs. And we can certainly see that borne out in this chart here. So the key support for me, I don't know whether you agree with this, Colin, or not. Um, and I know you're there, Colin, so hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm doing all the talking, aren't I? Um, yeah, the key support here, I think, is in around this 2020, where it was, uh, where it had broken out previously. What's uh, uh, the sorry, the September, uh, the September high there, and it's broken yeah. through that. So far, been tested as uh, as new support, uh, particularly when we look at these two bodies in early uh, in early November here, where you had one day was resistance, the next day was support, and you've continued to track up through there. The one thing I am keeping an eye on, though, is it does look like we're kind of leveling off. If we look, if we look back at the the August rally we see how it kind of really took off in the first two days and then as we moved along it got the, the candles got uh, got smaller and smaller we moved into a series of dojis or near dojis and it just kind of flattened and it looks as though even though we're getting new highs in the states it, yes, and it looks as though we're starting to get into the same kind of thing here, smaller trading ranges, and uh, and even though we are we are, I mean, I know it's, we're talking on the day when the the Dow and the S and P have, have touched new highs, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of oomph behind this uh, behind these breakouts. They're not they're not breaking out and just blasting through. They're they're just kind of breaking it by a few points and then just kind of sitting there and and managing to, to just barely close higher on the on the day. And, and and if you look at the bottom when we look 
look at the stochastics uh, tells us why, which is that we're getting pretty overextended on this rally, and we're probably due for at a minimum to kind of start going sideways for a while, as we did through late August, early September on the S&P at, at a minimum, and, and we are still at risk of a, of a correction at some point. Yeah, I think what we're seeing is incremental gains, but they're very, very slow and very, very gradual. Mm -hmm. And it's a similar sort of story, I think, on, on, on the Dow, the US 30. Um, probably not so much. That's a one-minute chart. You don't want to see that. So let me just check. And there you go. I mean, again, you look at the, you look at the oscillator there. You know, we're, we're incredibly overbought, and yet we continue to go higher. The difference here is obviously that the move higher is a lot more extended, and I think that's simply because um, it, this is not what I would call a particularly well-weighted index. Um, if you look at the Dow and the fact that um, Apple's not in it, really it begs the question, is it really you know, a, a representative index? And I would argue that it's not. So that being said, um, the key support on that lay, lies all the way back at 17,300. But what is particularly interesting I think is the fact that despite the blue chip indexes continue to push higher, um, the small cap continues to lag behind, though we are now pushing against or beyond the September highs that we saw um, through here. If we look at this horizontal line that I've drawn through here, and you can see now how important and how far away, in fact, we are from the March and June, July highs that we saw earlier this year. So you can see from this, for most of this year, the small cap has l led the Dow and the S&P. That's no longer happening. And that, for me, I think is a little bit of a concern. And um, I think you used a very good military analogy, um, Colin, so I'll let you tell it. Uh, yes, uh, basically, as I call it, the troops have, no, have stopped following the generals. The, the big cap stocks have continued to move higher, but the smaller cap stocks have been dragging behind. And that's suggesting that it, it's what I call in the market a case of really bad breadth, because it's easy. One thing, as, as Michael noted about the Dow, there's only 30 stocks. It's not that representative anymore. Uh, Apple's not in there. And flatly, all you need to do is move about four or five stocks to move the Dow. Right uh, uh, on any given day, so it's a and, and what that means is that you've got the gains of again another sign of exhaustion. The gains are getting concentrated into a smaller number of large cap stocks, whereas the broader number hasn't been following. And in fact, uh, up until the last few days, it's actually been kind of going the other way. And uh, and when you do get these kind of divergences, it tells you that that the that the advance is not that healthy. The advance is probably getting overextended, and uh, and, and because people are less willing to pay up for. Uh, for the uh, for stocks at this point, and, and, and if anything, starting to take some profits off the table. So we are still vulnerable here uh, on the indices, even though the uh, even though the uh, sorry the the Russell is trying to uh, trying to play catch up here. If it does get through 1190, then it probably will take a run at that previous high up near 1215. But if it doesn't, then you're uh, you're you're looking at it would be another sign of uh, another sign of weakness. And it again is like uh, like the others is getting really overbought here. Okay, so that's the U.S. market. So at the moment, it's really a case of buy the dips. I don't think you know if you if you if you're trying if you're trying to fight if you're trying to fight and try and pick the top, it generally tends to be a fairly dangerous thing to do. But um, when we look at European indices, it's a slightly different story, and that's that's no better borne out when we look at these particular charts here. And this is a chart that I covered in my weekly video on awful. Tuesday, and we look at that. We and this is a German 30, the DAX. And we've got the 200-day moving average, which generally I find quite useful. But look at this candle here. This candle here leads me to believe that for, real, for us to really push higher, first and foremost, that is, that is a bearish engulfing, a bearish engulfing candle and a key reversal day. So technically, that's quite negative. What we need to see now on this particular chart is for us to break below this Fibonacci retracement level here. That's 91.20. Now, that's the 50% level of the decline from the September highs to the October lows. Now, we're above that, and it's acted as a fairly good support and resistance in equal measure on the way up. And now what we're seeing here is I've circled this, and it's an island. 
the, you know, there's a bit of a gap there. The gap has now been filled, and that gap is now acting as a little bit of a support line over the course of the next or the last few trading sessions. If we look at the bottom of that candle, that's around about 91.20, 91.45. So 91.45 there. I said anywhere between 91.45 and 25 is going to be key support. We are starting to lose momentum as well. You know, and again, I think that's very, very key. We're losing momentum. We've got a bearish engulfing day and a key reversal day um, from earlier this month. And, and we've also got lower highs and lower lows. So the momentum appears to be slightly with the bears on this particular chart. And, um, and on top of that, Michael, you've got a, uh, on today alone, you've got this uh, rally back up to that 9302, which was also mm -hmm. a Fibonacci level. You failed at that. You failed at the 50-day moving average. And you've got the stochastic crossing back under 80, which is also a signal. So mm -hmm. it's uh, even pre, uh, we're, it looks like we're still holding that one support level, but it's, uh, it, it is breaking down on a whole bunch of other measures. Now, that in itself obviously is not conclusive enough for me in terms of the overall direction of European markets. What I'm looking for is confirmation, and that's what Dow theory is about. So let's have a look at the Euro 50 and the CAC Caron to see whether or not we've got, similar, we've got a similar um, scenario unfolding. So let's look at the Euro 50. And again, it's surprisingly how similar that looks. And the difference is here, obviously, we've got a lot more um, negative rollover. But again, look, same candle here. But again, we've got a support line just around about the 50-day moving, sorry, the 50% retracement. We haven't closed below it. We've had a little flirtation below it here and here. But thus far, we haven't closed below 30.45 or 30.40. We're about seven or eight points above that now. We're still below the 200-day moving average, but more than important than that, we're also below the 50-day moving average. So, again, momentum here is currently favoring the bears, but once again, what we're seeing here is there's a fairly good degree of buying interest around about the lows um, of the last few days right through here around about 30.28. So 30.28 has basically been the intraday lows throughout November. So that's, that's, that's a key level for me going forward. But what we also want to see is a close below 30.45. So that's the Euro 50. Let's also look at the CAC Caront. And again, we have got... Um, the, the market trading below its two key moving averages, and this time I actually haven't put the Fibonacci retracement levels in. I'll do that. September highs there, October lows there. Okay, that Fibonacci retracement 61.8. It's held very nicely. Let's just get rid of the smaller ones. We can do that fairly easily just by removing them there. That way we don't clutter up the chart with unnecessary um, lines that we don't really add that much in the way of value. So I've left the 50 and the 61.8 on there. And again, similar sort of story. We don't have a key reversal day there because we haven't had a higher high. We've got a lower high, but we do have an engulfing candle. And that in itself is, is fairly negative. But again, it's a similar sort of story here. Support through the lows. And again, let's draw that in there. And that's around about 41.50 which also happens to be today's lows. So what we're looking at here, ladies and gents, is we've got a sideways consolidation in terms of Europe, and what we need to see is a conclusive breakdown on all three at the same time at those various levels that I've described. At the moment, we're trading in a bit of a range between those monthly lows, currently around November lows, and the highs that we've seen this month. And what we want to see, and what I want to see, is either a significantly or a conclusive break higher or a conclusive break lower. And until such times as we get that, this divergence between U.S. markets and European markets is likely to continue. Is there anything you want to add, Colin? Uh, no, at this point in time, the uh, the European markets are definitely uh, uh, definitely have been uh, have been rolling over as well. They're not looking 
as uh, as strong and and that's another divergence in and of itself even for the uh, for the American markets is that the US markets have been going higher but they're doing it increasingly in in isolation if we look at other markets around the world the uh, Europe has been rolling over it's been going the other way the uh, the Nikkei had exploded in 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 recently and it's but it's gotten a little bit choppy and the uh, the Australian market had a rally but it's been starting to roll over the last couple of days as well so uh, the US indices are even within so not only are we seeing a breadth within the United States decreasing, but but the breadth of the the rally uh, over the, like a, a month ago, back mid October, we had mo a lot of indices around the world were oversold, and they all kind of moved up together. Now we're starting to see them go in different directions again. A number of them are starting to roll over. The U.S. is just barely eking out new highs on on a day by day basis. So things just generally that big rally that started back on the the 15th of October is looking really tired, and things look like they're they're breaking down. Here. And of course, without realizing, I actually put that low, I put that Fibonacci retracement on the wrong low. So we've actually traded slightly below that 61.8 retracement. But again, I'm not overly concerned about that. I'm more concerned with the 50 and 200 day moving averages. So again, here, similar sort of um, story as we were saying earlier, it doesn't change the overall um, analysis. It just gives you a slightly different variation in terms of the, re, the retracement level. So what's going to cause European markets to either go higher or go lower? Well, we've, tomorrow we've got GDP numbers out of Italy, we've got GDP numbers out of France, and we've got uh, GDP numbers out of Germany, but also we've got the final CPI figure for October. Now, if this morning's CPI numbers are any guide, we saw France CPI come in slightly above expectation. We saw and Spanish CPI come in slightly above expectation, and we saw French and uh, sorry, and we saw um, uh, Italian and German G uh, CPI pretty much come in as expected. So, I think if anything, tomorrow's final CPI number is not going to encourage anyone to think that the ECB will do anything anytime soon or take any further measures. And I think if that's the case, then the I think the incentive for European markets to push higher on the basis of further ECB action is therefore diminished. I think it's unlikely the ECB will do more at this December meeting. A number of analysts are saying that we're going to get QE in December. I do not buy that in any way, shape or form. I do not think we will get that simply because the existing measures that we've already, they've already implemented, they haven't had a chance to see through. The December TLTRO starts um, in the middle of December, 17th, 18th of December, they haven't seen the effects of that. As it is, some of the M3 numbers are actually starting to tick up. So that should actually be fairly positive in terms of money growth. And I think that will keep the ECB on the sidelines. And as such, I think help underpin euro dollar, which leads me on to my next point. Can Where I do we think on to that, Michael? Yeah, of course. I had done a bit of work on the ECB's balance sheet, and and, and through the uh, through October when they were talk when they've been talking about uh, you know starting their bond buying and, and and everything else even before they get to to full on QE. In October, the EC balance, ECB balance sheet actually shrank by about 14 billion euros. So they've got enough to do just on what they've already announced. As, as Michael said, the uh, the the next uh, targeted LTRO is in December. The the September one was only about 80 billion take up, and then the street was expecting 150. So so, it, I mean, they've got a lot of work to do just on uh, just on rolling out their existing programs. You, you, I would think the QE3, QE would be more of a, of a last resort if nothing else works, but they haven't even really given a good go with, uh, with what they've already been planning. Well, there is that as well. So let's look at this Euro-Dollar chart, because for me, I think 125, 10, 20 is key. Let's look at this here. We've got what I would call a slightly bullish candle here. Um, it's not quite an engulfing candle. It's what I call a piercing pattern. So we've had a lower low, a marginal lower low, and we've we've basically pushed more than 50 to 75% into the body of the preceding candle. Now, we haven't strongly rallied away or through 125.10 yet, but that's not to say that we won't. Now, let's drill this down because this potentially could be a little bit of a triangle here if we drill it down into a two-hour chart. So let's do that. So let's go and draw some trend lines here. Now, this is generally what I tend to do. I tend to do a, a, a top level and then a drill down. Now, look at this line here. 
So we can see straight away through the lows, there's a nice little line. We've got this two-hour chart over 26 days um, since the beginning of this month pretty much. We've got a succession of higher lows. What we want to see now, let's draw a line through here. And we're just testing the top of that right now. Um, you know, the question is, do I really think that's a valid line or do I think that's a valid line? Irrespective, we've got a cluster of highs through 125. The oscillator is starting to look fairly positive and it's not even at 60% yet. So I think there's certainly potential for us to push through here get to 125.10, and if we can punch through 125.10, then it really opens up the highs that we saw at the beginning of November at 125.70. Those weekly jobless claims that we saw this morning, slightly weaker than expected, 290,000. They were slightly higher than expected. We were expecting a region of around about 275, 280. If US retail sales tomorrow disappoint, then that will be dollar negative, and that could actually help push euro dollar higher. So the catalysts tomorrow for euro dollar are going to be the CPI data in the morning and the GDP data, but also the retail sales data out of the US in the afternoon. So these are the levels that I'm looking at on euro dollar. Through 125 and the trend line support from these lows that we saw in November. Anything you want to add, Colin, before I move oh, yes, on to the cable? Yeah, so I just wanted to mention in general on, on currencies that, and, and particularly U.S. dollar, that the massive U.S. dollar rally that we've had has been predicated on the Fed's going to be under a lot of pressure to move really quickly on interest rates and to, uh, and to move up their timetable on interest rate increases into the early part of 2015 from the, the, the previous broad expectation of, of mid-year. So the, the Fed has a, a meeting in, in June, and that's when, when a lot of people were expecting it either in June or in July they would start raising interest rates. The, the U.S. dollar took off on the feeling that, that hey, maybe that gets moved up to, I don't know, February or March or, or, or something like that, ASA March. And, um, and, uh, but that's increasingly looking like that, that may not be the case. I mean, we've got, we've got uh, uh, falling commodity prices taking the pressure off inflation. The uh, inflation num uh, uh, employment numbers are, are okay. They're, they're great. They're, they're solid. They're well supported. But they're not screaming higher to the point where the Fed has to absolutely do something. And, uh, and so because of that, what are we starting to see now? Well, we're actually seeing base building in, in euro dollar. And we're, seeing, uh, we're also seeing some rebounds in, the, in some, of the, uh, some of the other dollars as well. So it does look as though the U.S. dollar rally is getting tired, and Michael's absolutely right. If you saw any weakness in the uh, in the retail sales, we could actually see the U.S. dollar start to come back the other way, and uh, with the with the pressure coming off the Fed. So while it appears that we're building up a little bit of a base in euro dollar, I'm not going to say that is a definite given because things change very very quickly. You just mm -hmm. basically trade the price action, and we could just as easily come down sharply, break that trend line, and retest the lows of earlier this month. That still doesn't, that doesn't appear to be the case in the case of the pound. The pound continues to look weak, and we are now testing the bottom of that wedge, and we're also testing the 157.20 level. Um, and why is 157.20 important? Well, let's look at what I drew earlier. You may recall the lows, the double bottom or the double lows that we saw in 2013 at 148.10. So 148.10, we've got a rally all the way up to 171.95, or 61.8% Fibonacci retracement of that, 157.20. Where are we now? Just above that. So that's the weekly chart. So now let's drill down into this. Let's just get rid of that. And we are right at the bottom of this. And again, this, you know, I pointed this out in my weekly video on Tuesday. There was certainly potential for cable to drop to 157.20 and the bottom of the wedge and the bottom uh, and the 61.8% retracement level. So that for me, I think is fairly key, irrespective of what we do with this little line here, which I will now redraw, because at the moment there's no guarantee that it won't, um, won't need redrawing again. And at the moment it has broken lower, but there is potential divergence here. Um, that's not to say that this won't continue to go down. So why are we going lower? Well, we're going lower basically on the back of yesterday's inflation report. Low inflation, lowflation, whatever you want to call it. 
uh, Mark Carney basically said that he expected to write, have to write a letter to George, Os George Osborne within six months when CPI dropped below 1%. And some say that's a bad thing. And um, I would argue it's not necessarily a bad thing, certainly not if you look at oil prices and not if you look at food prices, particularly when the UK consumer has had a wage squeeze for about the last five years. I think if average earnings are going up to 1.5% or 2% and inflation is at 1%, I think that could actually be quite nice, um, certainly give consumers an awful lot more disposable income. Obviously, what we don't want to see um, with any you know, degree of... We don't want to see outright deflation, but I certainly think that commodity price deflation can actually act as a form of stimulus. And I certainly think there's a good chance that we could see that as we head into the Christmas period. So once again, look at the UK consumer data, the retail sales data as we lead up to Christmas, because actually I think that could well help underpin uh, the UK growth story that uh, at the moment does show, appear to be showing signs of slowing down. And we saw that when the Bank of England revised its growth forecast lower and revised its inflation target lower. And if anything, Mr. Carney doesn't anticipate inflation to get back to 3% or 3%, is it 3% or 2%? In, yeah, 2%, 2%. Um, 2 within the next three years. So that is obviously means that interest rates here in the UK are going to stay lower for longer. So 157.20, keep an eye on that. That could be quite important and could provoke a bit of a bounce back. And if it does, we could move back to 160. And the low One today... I... Go on. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'll finish that and then I'll... I just wanted to mention something. No, I was going to move on to euro sterling. And I was about to say, unless the, re the recent weakness in the euro is basically... Sorry, the re recent weakness in the pound is one of the reasons why we've seen euro sterling break higher. Yes, it's starting to move. And, and the important thing here with with interest rates is, uh, of course, with the UK now. Uh, similarly, people had been wondering would the uh, would the first interest rate increase be before or after the election? It's now looking like it's going to be well after the election. And, and flatly, it's it's looking as though the the US and the UK may end up moving at, at about the same time on on interest rates. Probably, uh, it's looking like sometime next summer, at the earliest. Yeah. Uh, if well, not later. What I would also say is that unless we unless we get a rate hike in Q1, we're not likely to get one until after the election because the Bank of England will not want to be drawn into a political row about, you know, sort of being biased in any way, shape or form. So, you know, if the rate hike doesn't happen by March, it won't happen until June, simply because April will be too soon to the election and the election is May, uh, the May the 7th. And uh, that is a Thursday, which means that the Bank of England will announce its decision after the election in May, not before. So all of these sort of things you sort of have to take into account, when, certainly when you're playing the politics of it. But at the moment, looking, looking at the pound against the dollar, I think a large part of this is, is slightly overdone, certainly in terms of the context of... Um, interest rate expectations, but I do expect us to have a little crack at that 157.20 level over the course of the next few hours. So let's look at euro sterling because we've broken above that 78.70 area, and I think there's a you know there's a there's a very good chance. I don't know what's happened to my trend lines; they were on here, they're not anymore. But once we broke above 78.70, which was this resistance level through here. We were trading in this little box range um, and had been 78, 70, 78, the figure. Once we broke out of that, um, my next resistance level is around about 79.40. So um, if we look at that there, we can see straight away what a nice little range that was. We broke out of it, went up to 80.90, came back, tested it, now we've gone away. So now we're really the key the key level for me is 79.40. So why is 79.40 important? Um, quite simply, it coincides with these series of highs through here. So let's go and do that again. You know, and it's fairly straightforward, this stuff. It's not rocket science. You know, you look at this and you look at where the accumulation of highs and lows is, and then basically you take your support and resistance levels off that. And, and as I say, it's fairly straightforward. So we look at the daily chart. The oscillators are starting to go positive on the daily, but on the four-hour, 
it does appear to be starting to roll over. So I certainly think that if we don't break above 79.40, this will start to tail off and we'll come back and retest the figure. Yeah, so the overall, it does look like that's starting to bottom out. If you looked at the uh, the little longer term chart, you, I mean, here you've got uh, kind of a small triple bottom. If we go back to the daily chart, you can see there's a double bottom, and um, and I believe it was on the one minute chart you showed earlier. You were actually getting close to a golden cross of the very short term averages. So uh, things are starting to suggest signs of uh, uh, signs that, that this thing's getting pretty washed out here. In, uh, in general, and uh, the, the pound has had a pretty good run here against the euro for, for what much of the last year on on feeling that the almost two years that the that the, that the ECB is getting more and more dovish, the the Bank of England was getting more and more hawkish, and well maybe the edges get trimmed off of that, and we start to uh, we start to see that there's a, there's room here for a uh, a bit of, a bit of a reversal, I think, Michael. I still think, though, that uh, the, the policy frameworks of the two banks are still yeah. moving in opposite directions. Um, okay. if, you know, I mean, the fact is the, the Bank of England is probably, I think at the moment there's an expectation that maybe on the margins the next move in UK rates could be lower. I've heard it mentioned, I've seen it on Twitter, actually, that uh, some, some economists are saying that actually that we could cut base rates. Personally, I don't buy that. I don't see there's any reason for us to do that because the last thing you want to do is weaken the pound further. Um, but having said that, if you want to generate a bit of inflation, why not? But to my mind, I think I've seen enough inflation over the last five years to last me a lifetime. So I don't particularly want to see any more. A strong or weaker pound, generally between 150 and 160, is about where the pound's been over the past 10 to 15 years on average and basically 135 and, and 175 have been the outer extremities so as long as you bear that in mind i generally think that the pound against the dollar the, the general consensus has re really been around about 155 which is not far away from where we are at the moment right colin let's talk about the yen because i know that people are looking at the nikkei they're looking at dollar yen and they're thinking where do we go next so let's start with dollar yen and when we look at this weekly chart, we can see how absolutely nasty this move has been. Now, let's put this move in perspective. When the, Bank of J I know it. when the Bank of Japan announced these new measures here, okay, well, when it was around 110, basically they announced an extra 10 to $15 billion a month. That's all. And yet we've gone from 109 to 116 on the basis of 10 to 15 billion dollars a month. Anyone here think that's slightly excessive? Or is it, or is it basically the Fed's tapered by 15 billion and the Bank of Japan's added by 10 to 15 billion, therefore you've got a 30 billion swing? I'll leave that there hanging for here. I because I've been looking at this, and when I first looked at this chart, uh, particularly last week, uh, it looked to me like it was a flag pattern forming where you had it, uh, that big spike, it was going sideways for a couple of days, and then it started to break out again. It's continued to climb, but I noticed the second phase has not been quite going up quite as fast as the, as the first phase, and we're, all, we're getting overbought on the stochastic. So initially, I was looking at a measured uh, move. If you went 109, 114, and then measured that up again, had measured you up to about 119. However, mm. the, it, as I've looked at this in the week it's progressed, I've been increasingly wondering if we're actually going to get there or if we're just going to kind of level off here in this 115, 116 area, maybe 117. Yeah, I mean, you look at that low in November around about 113.80. Um, that, that was just before we hit 116. Now we've hit 116 or tried to hit 116 three days in a row. Let's drill that down. That doesn't That's really tell me struggle. anything. It's starting to struggle a little bit on the four hour chart. You had a bearish candle there, but it didn't really follow through on the downside. We've gone a little bit higher. So that was 115.50 through there. This is 116. 50.55 there. The divergence on the stochastics. You are getting that, but again, you know, you're trying to pick the top, and it's always a dangerous yeah. thing, particularly in a market where the market really wants to ramp dollar yen higher. And, you know, if you're looking at dollar yen, you also have to look at the Nikkei because the two are directly correlated. So if we go take that dollar yen off, you know, I'm still looking for 120. The big question for me is how we get there. And at the moment, I'm not confident enough either way 
to really go all in and say you've got to buy dollar yen here or you sell dollar yen for a move back down. You see, again, here, look, as soon as dollar yen launched higher, so did the Nikkei. It launched higher as well. Weaker yen, great for Japanese equities because basically they're net exporters, therefore a weaker yen is going to be very, very good. And look at where the Nikkei is. Look at that daily chart, that daily candle chart. We're on the highs. So is dollar yen. Dollar yen is on the highs. And actually, on this on, on this chart here, we're seeing that actually we're above the previous highs in October. Therefore, if you're trying to pick the top in dollar yen, I wouldn't be doing it yet, but not on the basis of this particular chart here, because the Nikkei is on the highs of the day. And yes, I know the Nikkei is closed, but this is our Nikkei future, and we can see it's continuing to push higher. So trying to pick the high in dollar yen when the Nikkei chart is doing this could end in tears. So bear that in mind. Look at what the Nikkei is doing. Yeah, then that would be like trying to stand in front of a freight train. Not a good idea. Not a, not good at this point. Not a good idea. It would be a very yeah. brave thing for someone to do. So there is some talk that um, uh, Shinzo Abe could be calling a could, could call in an election, or is in the process of potentially calling an election and abolishing the sales tax hike. Well, obviously, if that's the case, the, the new one, then that will weaken the yen. If it weakens it will be good for the Nikkei. So at times of political uncertainty, sometimes it's best to wait for a bit of a sell-off and look to try and pick up the Nikkei or buy dollar yen if we get a pullback towards this area down here. So this area down here will be around about 112.60 on dollar yen and around 16,350 on the Nikkei. All right, let's look at um, oil prices because I'm sure you're dying to know where they're going. And um, if I may be survival, I think they're going down. I think they're going down big time. First and foremost, let's look at um, this monthly chart. Let's just hide the drawings. Now, this is the worst run of monthly um, candles for crude oil since 2008. These are, the these are the monthly chart in 2008. Here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Obviously, this is November. November's not over yet. So that could that could easily reverse, but look, one, two, three, four, five. So five successive monthly declines. What does that mean for currencies like the ruble, the Canadian dollar, um, and other oil producing Norwegian countries Norwegian like Krona. Norwegian krona? It means that those con those currencies are likely to remain weak. So can we see dollar ruble at 50? Absolutely we can. I don't think that there's any doubt about that. Um, you know, at the moment, you know, Mr. Putin seems to be intent on a, a, a policy. He doesn't, seem to, he doesn't seem to be that worried about the strength or otherwise of the ruble. Now, the question is, you know, where can... Yeah, that's the level that I'm looking for. Once we broke through 88 there, we went quite a bit lower. So where's the next level? The 2010 lows at $67 a barrel on Brent crude. Had Saudi Arabia coming out saying they're not in any rush to hike production. So what's the key date this month? 27th of November. That's the OPEC meeting. Could they announce production cuts? Big question. They might, but they might not. But certainly I think it, once we head towards that date and get close to it, you could you could certainly see a bit of a short squeeze start to unwind on Brent crude in the lead up to that on the basis that we might see a production cut. The, the big question is, will we? And that at the moment is the big unknown. So is there anything you want to add to that, Colin, in terms of the direction of travel? Certainly uh, it looks still to me... It's trending lower. I wanted to look at the... Um... Yeah, a little bit of a shorter term chart. Could you change the stochastics to the RSI, please, Michael? Sure. What um, what RSI do you want? Uh, just the uh, standard one is fine. So standard RSI. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me just get rid of that. Yeah, we are yeah, getting oversold on the short term. What I wanted to note: if you start at the beginning of September. And you go so through let me go this. to a slightly shorter term chart. So this is four hour chart or is the daily fine? Did you yeah, want to actually go back I wanted to, to show something on the, specifically on the daily. 
Right, okay, let's do that. And let's what I wanted that. to note here was just from the beginning of can you uh beginning of September, you'll yeah. see it got overbought in September, really overbought in October, and it's gotten overbought again in November. This actually is a head and shoulders bottom on the RSI, but it's too early to call it uh a, a turn, not when you when you've broken eighty and eighty's become the uh, the new resistance. At some point you'll probably see this thing start to bottom out and level off, but I don't think we're quite there yet. I don't we're we're get, probably getting close to the big washout. But uh, but we're probably not there yet. It's a little early to think about uh, about going against the grain here. But at, uh, as we saw uh, with uh, Michael at Sony, in 2008, you had six straight months of declines. Then it kind of started to go sideways for a while before turning up. The uh, the same thing here. Eventually, you'll you'll start to bottom out. But I don't think we're quite there yet. And I don't think we will be there until the RSI goes above 50. Because at the moment, since July, we stayed massively below 50 on every single test higher. So if you look at this RSI, you can see where the resistance level is. So oh, yeah, and it's a pretty clear one. Oh, and it's a pretty clear one. So that's that's Brent. So let's look at WTI. It's probably going to be a fairly similar story. This is the cash contract, so it's continuous. And again, now this is quite actually this is quite an interesting one. You can look at the uh, you can look at the oscillator, but look at that line that I've drawn in along through the lows there. That's the lows in 2011. So it's around about $74.80 on this particular contract. So again, worth keeping an eye on in terms of the support levels. But again, the direction of travel is fairly clear. Yeah, you, you've definitely got a shot at, uh, at hitting those pre, uh, uh, 2011 lows. Again, even though you're oversold on the stochastics, you could get a little bit more oversold. You'll probably level off at some point, but it may be that uh, that we see it uh, still choppy and weak through to the uh, the OPEC meeting, or in, until you get some kind of a, a sign from some of the OPEC producers whether they're uh, they're seriously thinking about cutting production uh, or not. I mean, they may just decide they want to fight it out over market share. Who knows? Well, Qatar have already announced a um, production cut, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what Qatar decides, it's what Saudi Arabia decides. Yeah. So they're sort of shooting themselves in the foot a little bit. So let's go and look at the cool. ruble, because someone asked me about that. Um, can we can we reach 50? Well, if the oil price continues to go lower, then yes, we can. Um, at yeah, the moment, you can see. No, exactly. I mean, you, you can see how choppy it is. You know, 45, 48 there. You know, and um, you know, it's a it's a very very volatile market. As, as can be seen from here, um, this, I mean, the spread on this is 4.3 pips. So again, you know, it's quite, it's quite a wide spread. Um, but having said that, you know, it's all about risk reward, and at the moment, that's just a little bit too rich for me. So let's look at another commodity currency. Let's look at Dollar Canada, and that was the negative divergence that we were looking at, I think, last Friday, Colin. Yes. And obviously the payrolls number that we saw, which was um, slightly disappointing from the U.S. point of view, but very good from the Canadian point of view. Absolutely, and, and so in the last week we've actually seen the uh, Canadian dollar has strengthened a little bit. It's done reasonably well considering that uh, that oil has continued to decline. Yeah, even though cl I mean, clearly when we look at this, it's it's still in a pretty broad uh, uptrend, just as uh, as crude has been in a pretty broad downtrend. But it is starting to show some signs that it, it, perhaps uh, perhaps it is starting to uh, starting to peak here. But it's got more work to do before it really signals a downtrend. At this point, you're you're still you're you're having what looks to me like a regular correction with an established uh, uptrend. At this point, you really got to bust uh, 113 at a minimum, and really I'd want to see it taking out that. That Fibonacci level there at is that one twelve thirty five? Yes, it's one twelve thirty five. Yeah, you've got to take that out before you can have any kind of a meaningful talk about a, a change in direction. At this point, it's it's a it's a, a normal consolidation. And you've also got a nice little trend line there as well. Yeah. Yes, and the, the trend line as well. Now, one of the things that has surprised me is, despite the strength of the U.S. dollar, the Aussie dollar and the weakness in commodity and commodity prices has continued to hold up fairly well. It's amazing I mean, too, and the Kiwi dollar has been spiking too. Yeah, um, I mean, is this is this just a good result of carry? I mean, you look at this one here. It's a quite positive. That's a bullish engulfing candle there. I talked about that on Tuesday. Since Tuesday, we have gone one. higher, but look, we need to now take out these two highs. This series of highs through here, ladies and gents. Look at that there. Oops, just redraw that. So look at the Aussie dollar again. Look at the 
Look at the aggregation of peaks there. So now that's three months. Let me go to four hours, and we can see right there, 87.60, 87.70 on Aussie dollar. That looks like a significant resistance level, um, as well as then there's a gap there, and we haven't filled that gap yet, and we need to. There's a gap between 87.60 and 88. Okay. Yeah, it's had a good, pretty good run here. Could you pull the Kiwi dollar as well, Michael? Yeah, sure, I can do that. So let's do the Kiwi. So what wow. I wanted to talk about with the Kiwi dollar here is it's gone into a, what's going to be a pretty established trading channel between 77 and 80. So you got to the bottom of it. It looks like you uh, have pretty much may have completed a double bottom here. You're having a nice run. You've broken the, that nice uh, downtrend line that Michael has been uh, had kind enough to draw in earlier. So you're here at 79. So what you got to watch for with this is there's a little bit of resistance around 79.20. Stochastics is accelerating upward nicely. You see it break through 50, it, uh, it would look a little better. And uh, But really what you got to watch for with Keeley Dollar is the 80 cent level. And uh, in fact, you see that one little high where it tested the trend line, Michael, where the X is? There, that you had that little gray stone doji, and uh, and what you had there was that was the one time it, the last time it peaked above 80 cents, and when it did, it got smashed right back down. So what you got to watch for with Kiwi Dollar is that uh, a lot of these declines were driven by the RBNZ. They've been actively intervening in the forex market and, and selling the dollar. So if you peak above 80, you do run will be a key test because that's where you're going to be watching to see is the RBNZ going to come in again and smack it back down or have they had enough and they're done their intervention and prepared to, to let it come back up a little bit. That's the level that you really got to keep an eye on. And it's quite startling how similar it is to the Aussie. Again, we've got a bullish mm -hmm. engulfing candle there and a key reversal day. But you've got a lower low and a higher high and an engulfing candle. So again, that's usually a precursor to a rally. So we've seen we've seen that started to roll out. And you know, if you're if you're basing your strategy on a stronger dollar, and you've got the Kiwi dollar and the Australian dollar are actually outperforming the US dollar, then that does sort of beg the question as to whether or not we'll get a little bit of a pullback in the broader US dollar currency sphere as well, i.e. euro dollar, dollar yen and cable. That's what I'm thinking because these are these seem they're, they're leading something because these were the two, uh, particularly the Aussie and the Kiwi were the two got, that got absolutely crushed the most by far on, on in the U.S. dollar rally uh, was the Aussie, the Kiwi, and the yen were the three currencies that just uh, just got totally steamrolled and flattened by the U.S. dollar. So if they're starting to show signs of life, would suggest it's a sign of exhaustion on the flip side for the U.S. dollar. Well, yeah, absolutely because Aussie dollar was peaked at 110. You know, and now, now it's back down um, around about 86, 87. So that's quite a substantial decline, automatic, albeit 110 was in 2013. But that's by the by. So let's finish up with gold, that old favourite. And we can see from this long term chart here that um, it is starting. This is, the, this is a weekly chart, by the way. So, you know, don't read too much into that. So this is the Fibonacci retracement from the lows in 2008 to the peaks in 2011. And we're currently below the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of that entire up move. And that's around about 11.55. Now, thus far on the weekly chart, we haven't closed below that. We've traded below it, but look at that. Is that a hammer? It sure looks like one to me. Looks like a weekly hammer. So is it hammering out a base? Well, judging by this candle here, it still remains fairly weak. We're still below 1180. And while we're below 1180, the risk is we can push lower. But as long as we stay below mm -hmm. on a weekly close, 1155, and this series of support levels here, then the bias remains for a bit of a short squeeze, but, you know, it's a big but here. If we do close below it, then we're looking at 1044, which is the 2010 lows. So this is basically the corridor here that I'm looking at in terms of the gold price. If we get back above 1180, we can get a short squeeze higher. If we close below 1155, then the next corridor is going to be 1045, 1155. 
And interestingly, when we had the, that weekly hammer candle, you also was the same week it coincided with the stochastics rolling back above 20, which mm -hmm. was a uh, also a bullish signal. So, but it, Michael's right; it's it's a little too early. I mean, it looks as though the the bearish pressures are weakening, but we're not seeing enough on the bullish side. It's not got, it hasn't got enough oomph yet to really break through and say yes, this is a this is kicking off a, a recovery trend. We, we're not quite there yet. Okay, so that's 45. We've run over by about 20 minutes, but that's fine. Um, before we wrap up, I've got time for probably one question from any of you guys. Is there any market that uh, we haven't yet covered that you would like us to cover? Um, you can basically ask us those questions by basically using the chat facility on your WebEx account or your WebEx link. Otherwise, um, Colin and I will wrap this up and we will put it on YouTube for you to listen back to if you want to um, within the next 24 hours. No? No questions? Okay. Well, okay. thank you all for joining us, everyone. Yep. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we will have this one of these again on the 11th of December. That will be the last one of 2000. And 14. Obviously, we've got non-farm payrolls webinar uh, on Friday, the 5th of December. Um, I will not be hosting this particular one. My colleague Jasper will, because I will be in Dublin. But uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending and um, speak to you all again. Absolutely. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Michael. Cheers, Colin. Thanks, Nate.